Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to call order again. The college consists of the following format. One, there is a brief announcements period to start everything off. Then our speaker will speak. Then we will have a question and answer period, and we request during the question and answer period that you actually ask a question. Because at the end of the question and answer periods are rebuttal period, where you'll be able to get the sound off and usually speak up to four minutes. And that's my take on it. All right, we have a speaker tonight. Dario Hunter, the Green presidential candidate, and he's advocating the Green agenda. We have his website up. I'd like to thank, what's your name, sir? Scott. I'd like to thank Scott for letting us get yeah. to the internet tonight with his iPhone. We'll see, we'll see. But I mean, you know, we're really doing pretty good with it so far. Um, potential Green Party presidential candidate, Daria Hunter, uh, JD, will discuss the priorities of the Green Party we need to advocate in 2020 to provide a competitive challenge to the two-party system. Hunter, a former attorney and educator, will discuss workers' rights, civil rights, education, foreign policy, and of course, securing a clean environment for future generations. For more information on, on Hunter, then just visit his website at DarioHunter.com. And let's give a warm, rousing round of applause to Mr. Dario Hunter. I think based on the enthusiasm shown earlier, I'm just going to make my entire talk about the Green New Deal. <laughs> okay. Oh boy. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Dario Hunter, and I'm from Youngstown, Ohio, which is a little Rust Belt town in between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, and it really is emblematic of a lot of the issues this country is facing as a whole. Uh, it has been pretty much halved in terms of population due to the pullout of the steel industry, the decline of the steel industry, and the economic downturn and blight that's taken place. And in effect, much of the city is abandoned homes at this point. With serious economic problems, serious um, equality issues, educational issues. And I serve as the as a member of the school board in Youngstown, Ohio, where we have been taken over by a state takeover. Our voice and our choice has been completely taken away from us and replaced with a CEO who has total managerial and administrative control. So the public pays taxes for the district, but has no say on what is done with that tax money. <clears throat> this democratic deficit problem, alongside the issue of the economic justice deficit, is occurring all across our country. And I can say I'm familiar with that personally because although I call Youngstown, Ohio my home, I'm originally from a city called Jersey City, New Jersey, where when I was a kid, it was pretty much a festering slum. I looked around and I didn't see much of promise around me. And so I kept my head in a book and managed to work my way out of the ghetto into Princeton and through three law degrees because I saw education as the ticket to a bright future. But not everyone's going to be able to do that, looking at the circumstances around it. So education has always been a major issue for me, because to me, that ability to lift yourself up and to be uplifted by a community that's interested in your educational advancement, to me, that speaks of our highest and most noble ideals as a country. I should note that my personal background has also shaped my experiences and my view on issues of justice. I happen to be from an African-American mother and a Persian immigrant father born and raised in Tehran. Um, my mother's background is Christian, my father's background is Muslim, so naturally I became a Jew. <laughs> I serve as a rabbi with two congregations, one in Borman, Ohio, and also as a campus rabbi at the College of Worcester in Worcester, Ohio. And is, if that wasn't interesting enough, I'm also very openly and proudly gay. And those identities shape my experience 
it also shaped my feelings about how important it is to get out there and connect with all the diverse parts of our country that help make this country a great whole. So I talked about my background and my story, what has brought me here today to connect with each and every one of you about trying to advance this sense of an American dream, although George Carlin would quip, they call it a dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> the sense of advancing this dream for everyone because I know how tough it is personally. I've experienced how tough it is. And so it's all the more important you have somebody who's got that tough skin, who comes from that diverse background, who can step forward and talk about a truly progressive agenda because that is what I believe America is hungry for. We've been living under the unfortunate rise of what is frankly a fascist regime and the only opposition to it is a weak need and weak watered pseudo fake progressive approach to dealing with the ills that are caused by the massive democratic deficit under Trumpism. The Green Party offers something very, very different. The Green Party offers the solutions to building a fair America. And that is what I want to focus on today. Those solutions and how we advance those solutions in preparation for 2020. Because this is going to be a tough race, especially for the idea of voting for a party other than the party duopoly that seems to have control over our political discourse. So when I talk about economic justice, we have to talk about the ability for America's workers to get a fair shake. And the Green Party has answers to the economic justice issues that we're facing. Together, we are going to fight for the human right to food, water, housing, and essential utility. There is a right to be able to have basic sustenance. In a country that's as wealthy as ours is, due to unfortunately the hyper-capitalist system that we have in this country, there is no reason that we should have people without housing, people who cannot feed themselves. So we call for the, res the restoration of a, a federally funded entitlement program that's going to support children, families, the unemployed, the elderly, and the disabled. We live in this era in which there is so much skepticism about providing social benefits and a social safety net for Americans. But if you believe, as I believe, in socialism, and I do consider myself a socialist, not just a cafeteria socialist who picks pieces here and there and says, here, this is a progressive agenda. I believe in really looking towards the health and welfare of all our fellow Americans. If you believe that, then you believe in having a social safety net for our fellow citizens. And as alluded to earlier, I do believe in the Green New Deal. Believe in 100% clean energy by 2030. And I believe in it because we have to believe in it and work on it together. Because as we've been told by reputable scientists, our time is limited to turn this around. The effects that we have, on, have had on this planet have been so dire that we have a limited amount of time in order to help heal the earth by refraining from our constant addiction to toxic fossil fuel. And this plan, this Green New Deal, the real Green New Deal, not the watered-down version being offered by cafeteria socialists from the Democratic Party, this real Green New Deal is going to turn the tide on climate change. And it is going to make these wars for oil, these interventionist activities that we engage in as a country end. We're going to cut the military budget in half. And we are going to cut it in half because our, thank you, I much appreciate it. I'm always glad to hear people who agree with that because we live in a country where you have people who are in, who are in schools that don't have textbooks. Why are we spending billions upon billions 
interfering in the affairs of other countries, when our children are not even getting the basic education they need and they deserve. If you want to talk about defense, then we'll talk about defense, because defense is having a well-educated citizenry and a strong infrastructure. That's defense. But the defense budget, air quotes, is truly a war budget. And it is not our business to engage in war and interventionist activities across the world. So we would cut that budget in half. And those bases all over the world that we use to engage in, event, in, in interventionist activities, we would shut them down. And so we're going to hold polluters to account for the damage they caused. We're going to have a carbon fee program. And we're going to f provide green jobs by enacting a full employment program. We're going to provide millions of jobs in sustainable energy and energy efficiency retrofitting, as well as mass transit and other forms of clean jobs, sustainable organic agriculture, for instance. And this effort, this Green New Deal effort, is intended to do much like the New Deal of old did, revitalize a country and prepare it to face the challenges of the future. We will protect workers' rights and protect unions because we value the contributions our workers make. And we value those contributions of our individual American workers and the families that they take care of and feed more then we value corporations and corporate greed. Corporations are not persons. The people who live next door to you who are struggling to make ends meet and feed their family. The people who are working multiple jobs and still can't keep the lights on. Those are people. And it's time we actually paid attention to them. We will achieve equal pay and equal rights for women. It is embarrassing as a country that we even have to still say that. It's embarrassing to think that we have this wide pay gap between men and women. And guess what? We still haven't passed the Equal Rights Amendment. We will pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Not yet. Not yet. Now, I did mention to you education. There will be tuition-free education from grade school through to college. Now, I've already mentioned to you how important education was for me in the come up. I went through law school, was able to, to become an attorney. I served as an environmental attorney in Israel, Palestine, and the things I learned from that experience were very valuable to me, but also valuable to the activism that I engage in, because having had that education, it has enabled me in my community in Youngstown, Ohio, to fight on behalf of my fellow citizens when it comes to issues such as free and fair elections, fracking, or just issues of public records and rights. I actually sued the Ohio Department of Education and the Ohio Supreme Court because they refused to provide public records in a timely fashion, and I forced them to settle and cough up the records. They are used to dealing with people who they feel don't have the level of understanding of the system to take them on and challenge them for their abuses. And they maintain that by mis- and undereducating our citizenry. Let's make no mistake about it, particularly when it comes to minority communities. The mis- and undereducation is systematic. And the environmental racism that occurs, I see it every single day, and I've faced it. We will bring that to an end. We will overcome that educational racism. We will overcome that deficit in terms of resources for education, for our country's students. We will support our children of color and make sure they do not get lessened educational opportunities and that they are not subject to the racism of lowered expectations. Having been a high school English teacher, a K-8 to educational administrator, I can tell you this, all children can learn. The problem is not the children. The problem is the adults. And some of those adults are attempting to make profit off of our children. 
We have charter schools that are running amok. We have state takeover plans that are trying to turn our public districts, in effect, into charter schools, not responsive to anyone, not truly responsive to the parents, not responsive to elected leaders, not responsive to democracy. We will bring that to an end. We will fight to keep local voice and choice in education. We will incentivize grow your own teacher programs so we have teachers in communities that understand the communities that they serve and care about the children that we serve, that they serve. And we will end we will end the structural racism in our buildings that exists in the form of policing that treats our children like adult thugs and criminals. They are children. They are to be treated as children. They are not to be criminalized because adults don't understand or don't care to understand how to properly educate them. Now, we are the Green Party, and so naturally, we are focused on a clean environment. Clean air, water, and soil for future generations. And when I talk about racism, unfortunately, we live in a country, a capitalist country, where intertwined together is this callous capitalism that sees, sees human beings as merely sources of profit and exploitation, and a spoke from that inner wheel is racism. Environmental racism is real. It exists. I have seen it in my community where neglected, neglected neighborhoods are left to fester with pollution because of their majority, minority status, and because exploitative companies and the so-called public rep representatives that aid and abet them think that the public won't care what happens to a minority community. We care. And when we connect with voters, we will show and demonstrate that we care because we're at the forefront of dealing with the environmental issues that affect them and affect the country as a whole. We will transition away from fossil fuels. We will end their harmful extraction. We will enact energy democracy based on public community and worker ownership of the energy system. And I think this is a key part of what distinguishes us from these other parties, this sense of people over profit. <clears throat> and as I have mentioned earlier, we are going to put forward these clear and achievable goals to transition to 100% renewable energy. We're going to emphasize the use of and invest in mass transit and alternatives to automobiles for transport. And we will engage in this in a mass scale nationwide effort and make sure that these systems are accessible to the public at large. We will shift our country towards, towards clean production and principles of zero waste. And we will maintain and enhance the provisions of the Clean Air Act. We'll put in place strict restrictions regarding dumping of toxic chemicals and pesticides. We will control or ban corporate farming. And we will bring to account transnational companies <coughs> that pollute our water system. Now, I want to give a little personal background on this, because I did mention my engagement with the issue of fracking. In the community of Youngstown, Ohio, we've had seven times on the ballot a measure to ban fracking and fracking transportation to our city. It should seem like a simple no-brainer. Who wants that in their backyard? Well, here's the problem, and here's also what was the inspiration for me in part to ramp up my act. I opened my mailbox one day and I found this glossy color flyer. This bill of community rights, it's a job killer. It's gonna kill jobs. We've got all these jobs coming in here related to fracking, related to extraction of fossil fuels, and we're hurting for jobs because the steel industry pulled out 
the 70s. We're still reeling from it. You want to damage our ability as a community to get jobs? I was going to say two things about that, but I have many things to say about that. First and foremost, <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent on those mailings. Massive amounts of corporate money to try to squash a grassroots effort to try to protect our environment. And in addition to that, the jobs, purely illusory, many of them came from outside of the Youngstown area. They brought in people from Texas, from Oklahoma. It really was just a way of playing on people's emotions. But the end result of it is trying to take away people's ability to say, not in my backyard. And that made me angry. It made me truly angry because this powerlessness that people feel against this corporatist regime that steamrolls over the health and welfare of the public. I knew that powerlessness is something that Americans all across the country must feel. So when we talk about as a party advancing the green agenda, we have to advance precisely that. Giving power to the powerless on environmental issues, but on every issue. <laughs> and speaking of giving power to the powerless, when we talk about power, we have to talk about money. Because in this capitalist system, it's how, it's how power, unfortunately, is measured. And there are those who will tell you that the banks that we have <coughs> And the big corporate fat cats behind them, they're too big to fail. This concept that we have to have to preserve this capitalist banking system in our country and the people who are profiteering off of it. There's no such thing as a bank that's too big to fail. Break them up. And make corporations and the rich finally pay their fair share. As we've already said, corporations are not people. The people are those who are sitting right in front of me out here. You're everyday people who face everyday challenges. And they're the ones our system should be focused on helping and promoting the interests of, not corporations. So we're going to seek an economic system that's based on a combination of, yes, private businesses but also decentralized democratic cooperatives, publicly owned enterprises, and other alternative economic structures. We feel that community-based economics is a big part of bringing this community buy-in into a broken system, a system that's broken, an economic system that's broken because of capitalist profiteering. And so, as a part of this, we believe in and we call for a universal basic income. Sometimes it's called a guaranteed income. And this is an issue that has been brought up in progressive circles for quite some time. But this is an important part of ensuring that we have economic justice in a country where so, so much money is made off of the backs of America's workers and the poor. It's truly very interesting that when you bring up the issue of a universal basic income, people scoff at that, but consider it to be completely OK that you have 1% of the country making massive profits off of the 99. We have to take care of each other as a country. It's a moral value, but it's also just a practical political principle. And so, by ensuring that everyone has a basic level, basic standard of food, housing, utilities, and income, we will make sure that we have a country that is fair and equal. And also, of course, we will make sure that there is an opportunity and a chance for employment. We will have job banks and innovative training programs. This is a part of the larger picture of preparing for a well-trained and educated citizenry. And in talking about fundamental fairness issues, I would be remiss if we did not mention 
the issue of health care. And I will also get a little personal about this because I did say that my roots come from a city, Jersey City, New Jersey, which in my neighborhood, at least my corner of it, was very much a slum in those days. Now, now through many lucrative real estate deals, it's kind of become a bedroom community for Manhattan. But in those days, I didn't have health care. I and my parents, we just kind of hoped we didn't get sick. God forbid anybody worked on the house or fell off a ladder or had something happen to them. We would have no way of paying for it. There are hospitals that charge $500 for little things like gauze. Our health care system is a perfect example of the American dream turned capitalist nightmare run amok. There will be single-payer health care for all, Medicare for all, with no co-pays, no deductibles, no restrictions regarding pre-existing illness. <coughs> and in part, we will do this by removing the administrative waste related to private insurance. We will redirect that waste towards patient care, where it belongs. <laughs> we will end the racism in health care that causes a lack of resources in minority communities. And this is something I'm personally acutely aware of, lower quality of services or lack of services in minority communities. Now, in talking about health care, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention reproductive rights. The Green Party supports, and I support unequivocally, a woman's right to reproductive choice. And this issue, we would think, is a settled issue. But it seems to be something that keeps being reopened over and over again, much like the broader issue of civil rights. There is this covert and sometimes not so covert effort to reopen it and scale things back. You know, we live now in the age of Trump and Pence, and especially with recent Supreme Court appointments, the murmurs are becoming more than murmurs about tackling Roe versus Wade. This is something we should be genuinely worried about. But our position as a party on this is clear. We support the woman's right to choose. And we support cost controls via streamlined administration. We support a fee schedule nationwide. We support bulk purchases of drugs and medical equipment. Now, why is this important? Because what I just mentioned earlier was the abuse of overcharging. You're going to have a healthcare system that's not going to work if you've got people charging $500 for gauze. And worse things, of course, have happened. I'm sure you're aware of the kerfuffle in the press with Martin Shkreli and the attempt to charge obscene prices for life-saving, well-needed drugs. We will bring that and that manner of profiteering to an end. Now, another issue that has become very important lately in public consciousness is the issue of immigration. Now, I'm sure you're aware and have heard of President Trump's, and I have to say it's still strange coming out of my mouth, President Trump's calls to build a wall. It's going to be the biggest wall you've ever seen. It's going to be the most beautiful wall you've ever seen. Well, there's nothing beautiful about hatred and racism. It's what it is. It's all it is. We as a country, as a country with ideals founded in freedom and liberty, although founded by people who themselves were slaveholders, as that country, we are constantly renewing and redeveloping and improving our connection to the ultimate universal truths behind those ideals. And that does not include building walls between people. We are going to build bridges. 
We are going to have a rational and fair immigration system. We're going to halt the unwarranted deportations and detentions. And I should point out, by the way, having name-checked Trump and his administration, there were a heck of a lot of deportations going on under the prior Democratic administration as well. So is there anyone here that has any illusions about their system and way of doing things being any fairer? I would tell you to check the stats on that. They're stark. We'll end those unwarranted deportations and detentions. We will end those night raids and the abusive separation of undocumented immigrant families. We will create a path to citizenship for immigrants that is reasonable and achievable. I know what it is for an immigrant to come to this country against great odds and contribute to this country through their labor and through their hard work. I know because my father did it. And if he didn't do it, despite all the challenges, working his way up from dishwasher to bus driver, despite all those challenges, managed to see two kids go off to college. In both cases, Ivy League. Now, it's an imperfect American dream, but it's definitely a part of what we want to encourage, that come up for America's hardworking immigrants. Green Party calls for permanent border passes for all citizens of Mexico and Canada with traceable and verifiable identities. We are, in effect, saying that this shuffle with the border, this militarization of the border, this ratcheting up of tensions with the border has got to come to an end. Now, part and parcel with this is an effort to impact negatively our civil liberties through efforts to put forward tracking systems, systems of identification that violate our civil liberties, often under the disguise of security for defense purposes in regards to hostile or would-be hostile immigration. I reject, the Green Party rejects, intrusions into our nation's, our citizens' civil liberties under the guise of protecting, so-called protecting, our security. Speaking of security and the many different fake arguments made in terms of protecting it, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the war on drugs. We will end hey, the on. war on the drugs. Ahead, okay? There are far too many people, people who I know, who are my neighbors, who are my dear friends, who have been negatively impacted by the criminalization of drug use that feeds into a shameful system of mass incarceration. In effect, the new plantation system for African Americans and people of color. And when you factor in the fact that prisons are increasingly being privatized for profit, and those companies running those prisons are telling their shareholders, this is a sure bet investment. Because guess what? Recidivism is very high. So the same people will come right back in. Well, in terms of drug offenses, Absolutely. When you criminalize drug use instead of providing for the treatment of what is a health issue, we will establish community oversight of police. And we will do that as a part of the effort to end the murders of people of color at the hands of law enforcement on the streets of this country, and that word is a conscious choice. When you kill someone for no other reason than the fact that they are a person of color, you are a murderer. You are not, you are not a brave police officer protecting the public. You are a murderer. We will end the quotas for tickets and arrests that create for-profit policing. This is what is happening in our country, in small and in big ways. From those who are actually taken into custody and arrested, all the way down 
to those aggressive speeding cameras popping up all over our country and violate civil liberties. We will limit the use of force by the police and demilitarize policing. Now I want you to understand what I mean when I say that because not everyone here will have an image of what a militarized police system is. But across this country, there are police forces in cities and towns large and small with enough equipment to equip a small army or military force. And in addition to that militarization in terms of equipment, we have police forces being trained by Israeli police in the exact same tactics that are being used to oppress Palestinians in Israel-Palestine. We will not have those colonizing tactics here, teaching our police officers how to abuse people of color even more than they already are. We will end the abusive surveillance, spying, and violation of our free speech that has been occurring under Democratic and Republican administrations alike. And we will fight the effort, the ongoing effort, to violate our free speech rights through laws against boycotting Israel and its human rights abuses. All over this country, when you turn on the TV, you hear every five seconds something about Russia. Now, without rebutting any of those things that you have heard, put that aside for a moment and recognize the fact that 26 states have laws against the simple choice, the simple free choice of engaging in a boycott against the country, Israel, for its human rights abuses. 26 states felt it was acceptable to abridge our free speech rights in that manner. Why isn't that on the news every five seconds? We will put in place a moratorium on prison construction, which is a part of the burgeoning mass incarceration system and the profiteering off of it. And we will encourage alternatives to incarceration. We will direct funds towards those alternatives. And we will conduct racial and ethnic disparity impact studies in order to see how existing offenses and new offenses may or may not be in creating or deepening bias. And we will, of course, abolish the death penalty. It's about time. It is past time. Our neighbors to the north have already done it. Britain has already done it. Now, when we talk about equal rights, we can't forget the indigenous people of this country. And keep in mind, we are out reaching out to Greens and potential Green voters all across this country. And this country is a very diverse country, so there are going to be points that are going to be accessible to everyone. And we cannot forget the contributions of and the many centuries of abuses directed towards indigenous people. We will affirm tribal sovereignty. We will affirm all treaties. And we will restore tribal lands to indigenous peoples, protecting their sacred sites and fighting racism against them. Through legislation, we will protect the rights and the lives of LGBTQIA persons because no free country should be a place in which you can be attacked or lose your job simply for being gay or lesbian or transgender. And I want to note this with special emphasis because not every campaign is brave enough to talk about it. I support reparations for Americans of African descent who have been subjected to centuries of slavery and discrimination. I support, and we as a party support, the creation of a claim of action and a right to recover inherited wealth and other profits that have been accumulated from the slave trade for the benefit of a trust fund towards reparation. Now, my differences with the Democratic Party aside, Michelle Obama was in line when she got up in public and said the White House was built by slaves. But guess what? A heck of a lot more than the White House was built by slaves. This country was built on the backs of enslaved human beings. 
It's about time we do more than just pay lip service to it. Now, we talked about, yes? How would that work? That's, that's, that's an excellent question. And, how can you? It's not question time. Yeah, we'll, wait, we'll, we'll get your questions at question time. Hold on to it, and I will definitely have an answer for you. But get the first it, is, question. it is an excellent question, it is an, and I thank you for it. Democracy. We talked about the democratic deficit. Okay. Now, as a third party, and I hate to use that term because it just reinforces the duopoly, uh, as another party outside of the duopoly that controls this country. We're very acutely aware of the democratic deficit that exists in this country. The deck has been purposefully stacked against us. <clears throat> Once again, on a personal note, I live in, I come from the state of Ohio, the Green Party just lost ballot access there. After many attempts to, to put in place and then reconfigure and then keep moving the cheese in regards to the ability to access the ballot in Ohio, I guess they finally found something that works to knock us off. They put a 3% threshold in place, and although we met that in a, in a prior gubernatorial election, we didn't meet it this time in November. And so the party for which I'm the chair of the Mahoney County Green Party, I'm a central committee member, you know, the party just disappeared. It's not an official party in Ohio. Of course, we still exist. We're still out there working and fighting for the interest of Ohioans as a Green Party, but we're wiped off the books for the interests of the two-party system. We are going to we are going to restructure the democracy in this country in a way that better reflects, best reflects the revolution started by our founders. Through ranked choice voting, through proportional representation, and through open debates, we are going to give this country a real choice. And we will remove those ballot access barriers put in place by the Republicans, the Democrats, and the corporate masters that control them. We're going to put an end to corporate influence through money over elections. And we are going to abolish the Electoral College and provide for the direct national election of the position of president through instant runoff vote. It's, it's been an interesting decade or so with these close call elections and these shenanigans close to the election, the use of voter ID laws to try to keep minority voters from coming out. You know, it's past time. It's overdue for us to actually dig in there, get under the hood, and prevent these kinds of democratic abuses from happening by putting in place a more fair system. Now, I mentioned our interventionist activities abroad. Why? Why do we have over 700 military bases abroad that we are funding with massive amounts of money when we have children languishing in schools without resources? We will close those bases, but one of the things we will also do is as a whole, in terms of our foreign policy, we will stop aiding and abetting human rights abusers around the world, such as Saudi Arabia and Israel. Now, I've mentioned Israel probably about three or four times at this point, and having done that, I, I want to also let you in on a little personal note. I happen to be an Israeli citizen. I'm an American Israeli. I lived in Israel, Palestine for a number of years in the city of Haifa, which is considered a mixed city, although in reality there are pockets here, pockets there, pockets of privilege, pockets of poverty, pockets of Arab communities, and pockets of Jewish communities. But it's considered a mixed city. As a person of color, as a Jew of color, on a regular basis, I would get a small, and I say respectfully, a small taste of what it must be like for Arab Israelis and for Palestinians when I would find myself randomly for doing things such as sitting on a bench and drinking water or walking in the street, being fake, 
<clears throat> excuse me, being faced with a drawn gun and a demand for ID for little more than being ground. And I would always wonder, after they checked my ID, because they do have a national ID system, and they look in the ID and they can find out from the ID, he's Jewish, he's born in the United States, and they give that ID right back. I always wonder what happens for those who aren't, who don't have those privileges. For those who were born there, and their parents were born there, and generations before them were born there, and it is their land that they've been disenfranchised. What happens when that ID check clearly shows that they're Palestinian? But what happened before that ID was given back to me certainly wasn't pleasant. Guarantee you what would happen after for them shouldn't be either. And there are definitely worse things they face. Home demolitions. The firing of live ammunition into Palestinian protesters. These are horrendous atrocities that no free nation should aid. We mentioned that we will cut military funding in half. But we will nonetheless ensure the quality of veterans health programs. We will raise base military pay. And we will honor our military by dealing with the military sexual crime crisis outside of the broken military judicial system. As a country, we will recognize the obligations this country has to take disputes with foreign countries, with foreign bodies, to the UN Security Council and the General Assembly Forum. We will recognize the UN and international laws and treaties and conventions and their role in helping to create a fairer, more peaceful world. One that hopefully in time can be free of interventionism and colonialism. We will take this country out of its many military conflicts across the world, its ongoing interventions <coughs> for profit, and we will bring the focus back where it deserves to be, the improvement of the quality of lives for our fellow Americans. And so, this, I almost said in a nutshell, because it was a very detailed presentation, but compared to all the things that would go into making this happen, this, in a nutshell, is what I present and what we present. And when connecting with America's voters, you're going to connect with them each on their own individual level. Yes, fracking is important. Banning it is important. But if you're meeting with, say, Jasmine, who lives on the south side and has three children, all of which are being undereducated in the Youngstown City School District, all of which have been identified as special ed, even though they are simply just African-American children who have not been given the adequate educational attention and have been pawned off into a failing special ed system in our area that doesn't care about that. She wants to know how she can make ends meet and also ensure that when she drops her kids off at school, they're going to get a decent education. So maybe the first issue you talk about with her isn't going to be fracking. It's going to be the economic justice issues. It's going to be the educational issues. But all of these issues, one after the other, will affect us all in different ways. It has been said by our president that our goal should be to make America great again. And we know what he means when he says that. He means to make America a country that is even less comfortable for someone like me a black son of an immigrant, gay Jew. To dial that clock all the way back to a time in which there were police, there were officers standing at that schoolhouse door blocking you from getting in. We don't have those officers doing that physically today, but through, ed through ed educational and economic disparity, we've achieved the same effect. He wants to bring us back to those dark old ages. And through the platform that I've laid out, based on and rooted in my personal experiences and personal struggle and the struggles that I see of the people around me, 
in Youngstown, Ohio, and across this country. This is a platform rooting in the principle of making America fair for once and for all. I thank you for your time. Question time. Who wants to take hers first? Yes. Uh, how was the reparation of slaves after the murder? How will it go about doing that? It's ultimately going to have to be a very broad based program. One of the things that I mentioned was tracking down those assets, those inherited assets that had to do with the slave trade, and that's going to take, obviously, it's going to take a very concerted and intricate effort, but there are many ways in which we seek to repair the situation, the status of African Americans, and that will be in part through concerted programs for economic justice to help African Americans get a fair shake in a society where much is stacked against them. We will ultimately have to create and compose a, a working task force to address and tackle this issue in detail, studying the ways in which African Americans have been impacted in this country by racial disparity, all the way from slavery through Jim Crow, through discrimination on down. And we will have to implement a wide variety of programs to bring that sense of equality that's, that they deserve after having gone through centuries of abuse. But there is no one solution to repairing that situation for African Americans. When we talk about reparations, people often think, okay, we're going to put a dollar sign on this. Let's throw some money at it, and let's make it go away. There are instances in which abuses have occurred towards people where reparations in the form of lump sum payments have occurred. One example of this would be the Japanese American well, I almost said internment, but really they were put in concentration camps. There was some reparations for that, a figure that pales in comparison to the abusive experience that they went through. And that is not what I'm advancing here. What I'm advancing is a comprehensive solution put together by a task force on this issue to not only study the effects of African Americans, post-slavery and post-Jim Crow and in this discriminatory era, but also create a broad-based program for addressing it that isn't just a payout of dollars. Okay. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, you've made a lot of promises on this speech. Yes. Hugo Chavez made a lot of similar identical promises back in 2000 when he was first elected. What's the difference between your brand of socialism and Hugo Chavez's. Well, I'm not going to sit up here and pick apart. No, no, I, I know, but what's the key differences? I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to pick apart his brand of socialism or his uh, you, you pick. This guy or? Yes. Okay. Um, the Green New Deal and the whole program that you've set out today yes. doesn't mention one of the major problems that faces our country, mm -hmm. everybody here knows what I'm going to say, mm -hmm. it's uh, the problem of nuclear power mm -hmm. and you're concerned about carbon and said, you know, there'd be a price on carbon and so on. Well, what about the pollution that is put into the air by nuclear power plants? The fuel cycle starting with in the southwest where the uranium is mined through places like Met Metropolis, Illinois, where the HF6 is produced, and the mills out in the southwest that produce the yellow cake, and then the HF6 and the cascade that refines the, the um, uranium so that it can be used either for weapons or for nuclear power plants. This is an extremely polluting process. Yes. And the Green New Deal has to, no, I can't say that. The Green New Deal should, if it really wants to be signed on to, call out nuclear the same as it calls out fossil fuels. Well, I am calling out nuclear. Nuclear energy is not clean energy. 
Right. I don't I don't see how anyone can Thorium. truly conceive on the face of it that the facts that are available, readily available, the nuclear energy is clean energy. All of the things that you have identified are ultimately ultimately at the core of what the Green Party and what eco socialism and environmentalism means to tackle these pollution sources, these sources of these sources of contamination, contamination that ultimately even generations will not get rid of. Fukushima. And if we combine that with rising water levels due to global climate change, we've got some serious disasters on our hands. As we have little and big Fukushima's taking place all around the world. And so I agree with you 100%. I agree with you in that focus and the need for that focus to be on nuclear energy not being clean energy. And it ought to be called it out. It has to be called out. It has to be called out. And I, I have a friend who's in Navajo, and she says, you may run into an old coal miner. You'll never run into an old uranium miner. Mm, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Yes. Okay. Last year, the uh, UN said that they want to eliminate all national borders in the whole world. Uh, they, uh, don't you think that would create chaos? Well, it isn't a part of the Greens platform or my platform to eliminate all international borders. Or the United States borders. They, they don't want us to have. Uh, they want to have open borders here. Okay. You go for that, right? It's, that is that is not a part of my platform. What is, however, part of my platform and what the Green Party supports is a more fair, a more equitable system in terms of crossing our borders. And we're going to deal with this issue, this, frankly, issue that has racist-laden associations behind it, this attack on the migration of Mexicans north into the United States and the undocumented workers undocumented people in this country who are being attacked in so many ways with night raids, with family separations, and even amongst migrant workers with sexual abuse. We are going to bring that out of the shadows and out of this abusive darkness and towards an era in which we fairly treat those who traverse our borders. But eliminating borders is not on the agenda. Let them come in legally. Answer. That's all we ask. Let them come in legally. Yeah, over here had a question. <coughs> all we have over there. there. Yes. Oh, yes. That's cool. Okay, who's next? You have a question oh. there? The tone might be up. I think someone in the corner. Hey, Jonathan, <coughs> tell us what his question is, Jonathan. He travels with me or with my if you have a passport, they can go in the back of the board. Okay. Believe me, yeah. ah, I, I think that's an, I think that's an excellent question. I think as a party, uh, in terms of our platform, in terms of our position on people with disabilities, I think we have to very, very strictly enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have to make sure that there is accessibility for people with disabilities everywhere, and that discrimination is tackled with a level of aggressiveness that any kind of discrimination deserves in this country. I can't tell you how many places of business that I have, businesses that I've gone to, even places, ironically enough, the mission for which is about diversity and inclusion. And you get to the building, and there's no ramp to get in. That has to end. And the discrimination that, that, the discrimination that those who are differently able face in employment, in terms of their, reaching their educational goals, we have to work hard to equalize this country educationally, economically, and socially for all Americans, because we all contribute, whatever your background and whatever your abilities and capabilities. I think Charlie, your hand was first, Charlie. Yeah, Dario, uh, I, I don't know, I care. I'm a pedestrian using public transit, and I'm rather disturbed to hear that you think my friend Russ over there, who owns a big Dodge black SU, gas guzzling SUV, can drive it at speeds in excess of the speed limit, endangering my life. Yeah. And you think he's got some sort of right 
Yes. To endanger yeah. my life, yes. Yes. and you want to get you want to get elected to endanger my life, so he can drive his gas guzzling SUV at 75 miles per hour. Well, I definitely, definitely don't approve of driving over the limit. You said driving he's got a right. He's got a right. He's got a right. So he's got a right to speed. You want to get rid of speed cameras? Yeah, he needs to get speed cameras. No, he doesn't have a right to speed. And he's <laughs> certainly, well, why certainly doesn't. He get, if I break the law, uh -huh. I pay my dues. I did my time in prison. Why can't he? You know what's you know what's interesting because we're facing this in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, one of the ways that they've decided to beef up the revenues that they bring in is by creating this this whole new speed camera regime everywhere where they bring in massive amounts of money sometimes Great. with relatively dubious technology sometimes in ways that can be disproven rather easily and ultimately ultimately my feeling personally is and the feeling of many of the members in my community many people I've spoken to is, is that ultimately in terms of the abuse of this tactic, I think it feeds into for-profit policing. I think when you as a community decide we are going to make our revenue off of the back of ratcheting up quotas for tickets, we, ultimately you create a system where policing, which is intended to be for the sake of law enforcement, you create a situation where policing is intended for the sake of capitalist endeavor. And that's never a good thing. You you have absolutely no chance of surviving getting hit by a car in excess of five miles per hour. No one should. And you what speed? Six thousand you saying it's okay. are killed a year. Absolutely. I think it's a lot more than five. There's a difference between shooting God damn it! Can I talk or not? Exactly. There's can absolutely I talk? a difference between well, speed traps and speed. Okay. My question, the International Panel for Climate Change says we've got 11 years. Yes, indeed. Do you, do you have a timeline to deal with this stuff? No. We've got 11 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this, this timeline, this plan, to have 100% renewable energy by 2030. Yeah, is, we should have been started on that a while ago. And we haven't yet started. So we've got to ramp this up. And all of the naysayers who are saying it's not achievable, you shouldn't do this, fossil fuels are just fine, clean coal, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, clean coal. In fact, the president gave a speech about it, and he actually said, yeah, we're going to put in clean coal. We're going to get the coal, and they're going to clean it. He clearly didn't understand what clean coal is supposed to be, whatever they think it is. But we clearly have to get this plan in motion, because you're absolutely right. We do not have the time to waste. We must transition towards 100% renewable energy. Back there. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Hunter. Yes. So you're going to, do you realize that Jill Stein and Bernie and the Green Party put Trump in office? Do you know that? All your green stuff that you're sometimes right, sometimes wrong. About. You know, I, 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 I get this statement all the time. And you, you guys to think. I Trump. get this statement all the time. And here's the thing. When we live in a real democracy, in a true democracy, what you were supposed to have, you're supposed to have choice. However, in this country, and I can say this as someone who's run for office and isn't one, I'm a member of the Young South Club. Unfortunately, in this country, we have an illusion of choice. You are convinced that you have a choice, but that choice is just two choices, folks. Oh, you've got a choice, but you can only pick one of two. Chicken or fish, Democrat or Republican. That's it. That's your meal, and that's all you got. And this illusion of choice is funded by corporations that feed into this corporatist, capitalist political system that fill the airways with ads, that put those signs all over the city while your grassroots activists and neighbors can barely compete to drown out the noise. The people who choose greens are choosing greens because we have the values to bring about a fair and a green America. And they're using that democratic choice wisely. And we are going to speak with a clear and a loud voice above the din of all of this corporatist money that's infiltrated our politics to ensure that we give an agenda 
and a platform to the public that really addresses the issues this country faces, okay. that really addresses the democratic deficit, the economic justice issues, the civil rights issues, the workers' rights issues, and gives Americans something to truly vote for. Yes, sir? Yeah, could you explain to him the process by which his argument will go away, and that's called ranked choice voting? One of the things we mentioned in our platform is making the system more democratic through ranked choice voting and the ability to vote in ways that aren't just one major party or the other major party, to show your preference, as has been done in other countries, and thereby give people more of a range of choice, will open up democratic choice. And proportional representation as well. There are countries that through proportional representation have found a place and a space for a myriad of parties in their legislature. We have mostly two and some independents. Can you explain how we're yeah. Okay. People don't understand that. Okay. So, could I give, can I, can I give an example? If you would like to give an example, absolutely. Okay, so I'm just going to give an example of ranked choice voting. If you simplify the 2016 election, so you got Jill Stein, Hillary, Cl uh, Hillary Clinton, and Donald Trump. So just three candidates. You're forgetting William. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just saying Lowe. simplified 2016 to understand it. So you want to vote for Jill Stein, but you're afraid of Donald Trump, so you vote for Hillary Clinton, right? That's what we did in the past. So ranked choice voting lets you vote for who you want. You rank them. You don't pick one. So you rank them. So you vote for Jill Stein. Then two, Hillary Clinton, number three, Donald Trump. The votes come in, who's ever in last place, let's say Jill Stein, she gets eliminated. And what counts is whatever you voted for second, if that was your vote. So then your vote goes to Hillary Clinton. So there's no such thing as voting for who you want to means Donald Trump gets in. So it's called ranked choice, instant runoff voting. Exactly. They have it in the state of Maine already. Yes, and it, that was an interesting election because uh, the colorful governor of that state wrote on, you know, when he signed off on it, he wrote, you know, stolen election. Um, there was a lot of animosity about that. But here's what it also does. What it ensures is that the eventual winner has majority support, and it also allows the voters to express their preferences while knowing that supporting the favorite candidate is not going to inadvertently help the least favorite candidate. And so this brings balance to the voting system. I appreciate you giving that example. And I just wanted to connect that aspect to it because people always, always ask afterwards, well, what's the difference? What does that amount to? This is what it amounts to. What it amounts to is a fairer and a freer choice. OK. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'd like to get into rebuttals. Jonathan's got one. Jonathan, you'll be the last question. Last question, Jonathan. Thank you for being here this evening. When uh, someone in our communities acts recklessly towards the others, uh, they're revoked of certain uh, privileges, maybe not of their human rights, uh, in what we would like to see as Greens as the future of this country. Uh, when corporations act recklessly, their, their corporate charters are not revoked. Could you talk about that concept? Well, it's interesting because you pointed out this great disparity, this disparity between corporations and people. We want to say that corporations, well, our corporate masters want to say that corporations are people for their own benefit when it suits them. And then suddenly when it comes time to pick up the check in terms of accountability, criminal accountability, they're nowhere to be found. So your implications behind that statement are profound. What you want, if I read you correctly, is for corporations to be held accountable. And I agree with you 100%. If corporations are acting like criminal syndicates, they need to be treated like criminal syndicates and broken up. And the people behind them that are engaged in the criminal abusive activities need to go to jail. How many times have we turned on TV and heard about some criminal enterprise to take a certain part that was a little too expensive out of a product and many people died? And then you hear no one goes to jail. Why? Why? Because a corporation can shield them, because corporate profit can shield them from responsibility. Corporations are not people, but they are responsible to the people for the things they do to negatively affect our lives, our health, our welfare, and our rights. So I understand your question, and I agree with your sentiment. Let's Thank go to rebuttals. Thank you. Okay, give our speaker a hand. Lawyer. Well, 
Okay, who wants yeah. to give a rebuttal tonight? Get your Some hands up uh, so we can get an accurate count. One. The rabbi part came out. We don't want to keep moving it up. I'm going to put a timer on the screen. You know, preaching. <laughs> oh, you need the wife, huh? Yes. Jim, you going to give a rebuttal? Yes. Nine. Okay. We got a usual three minutes. Four, I thought four or three. No, 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 we're, we're short on time, Tim, a little bit. We got nine people. Okay. 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 The, the, uh, the Democrats are backing a progressive agenda because they have to go along with them. So uh, they, in the last election, a lot of these progressives got in and uh, 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 Ocasio-Cortez says that uh, the world's going to end in 12 years. It's going to begin to end because of, of the climate, the, 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 the climate problems will be irreversible by then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Green New Deal, she says she wants to get rid of airplanes, air travel. She yeah. wants to get uh, 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 gas-burning cars yeah. and have all solar. I don't believe that that can be done. I mean, uh, not? not with our current technology. And uh, Medicare for all, that's what they're pushing, these socialists. Yeah. Medicare yeah. for yeah. all. Costs 25 to 35 trillion dollars in 10 years. Yeah. It's coming out of your pockets. How much yeah, is uh, You would also lose your privateness. I got Blue Cross. I don't want to lose my Blue Cross. Oh. I don't want to lose my Medicare. The Medicare will be diluted if you put 300 million people in there. Anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, the English, the England, the English National Health Insurance. When you go to the emergency room, you got to wait 12 hours, 12 hours to be seen. And non-emergency, six months in, in England. And there's a waiting list of, of uh, for five million people to, to see a doctor. And in Canada, socialized medicine, uh, in waiting times, you have to wait for, for four months to over a year for, for them to see you. And that's why they come to the U.S. Anyway, these socialists, they want to tax the rich like Maduro did. Maduro did in Venezuela, and their economy is, is uh, collapsed. And uh, th th these uh, socialists want to subsidize, subsidize college tuition. We're already at one trillion in debt with all these student loans. And most of these kids don't belong in college. They're going to teach them something else, like a trade or something. Yeah, most don't of them don't use their college degrees. Don't be nasty. Huh? Don't be mean. Don't be I'm mean. not mean. And, and you had, I, I didn't interrupt you, man. Okay. Okay. Uh, they want to give money to people who are unwilling to work. They don't, yeah. will not work. And they, and they want to give, the family, they want to give every family five, Five thousand dollars just because they're a family, yeah. and um, they want to <coughs> support. They support open borders. Yeah. Criminals, violent people, drugs coming over the border. Yeah. Jesus. Oh wait, one, one second. And they want to abolish ICE and the uh, the the the. Uh, they want welfare benefits benefits for illegal aliens. And the government is is already 22 trillion in debt, behind 22 trillion, and then uh, and the interest is one billion dollars a day. One second. You gotta wrap it up. Okay, uh, I think Trump has a very good chance to win in 2020 because of this uh, this Democratic agenda. And the caravans are coming. Oh. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next. Okay. Three minutes. Gray Wolf has something to say, a question to ask. Have you been trumped? Yes. There's this fellow who yells a lot and appears to be angry. You heard him suffer. Yes, he triggers and echoes your anger. And you say, yes, he's my man. Things are bad in my life and bad in this country. He has quick answers to the problems and you and me face, and you say, yes, he is my man. He promises he will take care of things, and you say, yes, 
He is my man. But sometimes anger can get you and me in trouble, creating more problems than they solve. It's not always he, his promises that will work. Anger can get in the way of knowing what to do. Working out all the problems we face can take time and patience. We have to face the problems together. Anger is an energy that can get in the way of seeing what to do in a more peaceful way. Yes, we all need that energy, and we know things are not right. But don't get caught up in all the yelling. There's work to do. Let us sit down, work together on them, without all the shouting. Okay. Three minutes. I've heard some of these redneck arguments presented a little, a little too often. The arguments that somehow um, Medicare for all is unworkable and that socialism is a load of horse shit, plain and simple. Thirty-five trillion. Hey, it's not your turn to talk. Well, don't talk about rednecks then. Sit down there and be quiet. It's a shame. Let me put this in line. Sit down there and shut your goddamn mouth. Oh, come on, come on. Order! Order! They said the same thing when Franklin Roosevelt was president and he first proposed Social Security. They'll have to have a number, all the conservatives said. And when they first proposed Medicare, uh, the, the AMA had a perfect answer. They had what they called these... Uh, these uh, coffee cup sessions where they invited the doctor's wives, this was 1961, remember, and they have coffee with their, with their friends and so on, and during which a recording was played of Ronald Reagan explaining how Medicare was really socialism in disguise. The idea was that these women would all then write their congressmen. So we've heard these arguments before, and I'll say it again, yeah, I think it's all a lot of redneck horseshit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Most of the audience. All right. Next. Okay. Go for it. Hello. What I learned um, in PBS, PBS is a very good um, TV. Um, Medicare care. Is that socialist? It's helping people who need help. It was made in the 60s, and people who were poor didn't have a way of helping themselves. And I get really angry when someone says it's socialist. It's not socialist. Thank you. Next, all right. Time's up. <laughs> all right. Anybody with a sax hat doesn't make no sense at all. Hey, your time is already up, Mike. Yeah. Cups right. won today in preseason. So we have the Green Party to thank for Trump. Okay, so, um, okay, speaking of elections, okay, the way I feel, I did this process of elimination with my, my brarian. So first of all, anybody that went into the Democratic race, the mayor race, after this bum Rahm Emanuel quit, should not be electable. So the way I have it come down now is, Vallis was in before Rahm quit, McCarthy was in before Rahm quit, Willie Wilson was in before Ron quit. This kid Koslar was in before Ron quit. That's why we need Mayor Ricketts. He ain't on the ballot. And Anaya was in, and then Jerry Joyce. So I think Jerry Joyce is corrupt, right? Because he, he had all these uh, stores at all the airports. <coughs> Anaya's kind of young. Kosler's kind of young. Oh, and Lightfoot. Yeah, Lightfoot was in before Ron quit. And McCarthy was in. Did I say that already? Yeah, I did. So, <clears throat> and I, so, 
Basically what it came down to is that really the serious candidates are Vallis, McCarthy, I like Willie Wilson, but he doesn't know how to, I don't think he can handle a big bureaucracy. He's running McDonald's stores. He runs McDonald's. Okay, so the way I came down to it is Vallis, Lightfoot, McCarthy are really your serious candidates for mayor. Those three. Yeah. Okay, so let me see uh, who's going to vote for Vallis. Not too many. Who's going to vote for McCarthy? Who's going to vote for Lightfoot? Who's going to vote for Daly? Oh, yeah, Daly. Are we required to? Who's going to vote for Daly? <laughs> yeah, he's really? a guy. Yeah, really? Really? The can't. corrupt Dalys again, huh? I, I, yeah. Who's going to vote the for Preckwinkle? Daly. Oh, yeah, Preckwinkle. I'm Bob sorry Bob. about Preckwinkle. I, I kicked her out because what, she joined what? after I Rock don't care. Quit. I'm voting what? for her. You kicked her out. Who's, who's voting for Preckwinkle? There are 30 seconds left. Two, three. So three for Daly. Who's going to vote for Ricketts? Ian on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to vote for Kozlar? And I, uh, how about Gary Chico? He came in after Ron quit. Is this a profiling session? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Willie Wilson. Who's voting for Willie Wilson? The vote by her <laughs> Who's voting for Mendoza? <laughs> she she, she uh, busted Daly's ass of being a crook. So uh, she gets back. She gets okay. probably for that. You're done, Mike. Hey, Your time's up. up. I, I always give up early. Time. Your time is up. Time Who's going to vote for Lightfoot? Yeah, no one's going to listen. Yeah? So it looks like this group's either Prickwinkle or uh, Daly. Nobody from McCarthy, right? Are you kidding? Vales is the most uncorrupt one there. All right, next. Sore losers. We'll find out next week. That's because we're Cub fans. You guys are going to vote for Daly? Some more crooks? No, Rick. Some more corrupt? Rick. No, well, 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 I should have put my own control over All right. Yeah. Well, um, you're going to vote for that crook? Another crook? The Green Party has moved to the left and has become socialist. And I think this is a very positive sign. And another thing, we had Bernie Sanders run in 16, and he's running again. And he brings up democratic socialism. So the word socialism is being passed around by a number of candidates. And it seems to be entering the mainstream to a certain degree. Now, we've been propagandized like they did in Nazi Germany about the Jews, about the socialists, about the communists for years and years and years. And they used Pavlovian, Pavlovian conditioning in order to, to make the people think that socialism is a bad system. In the United States, the same thing has happened. We've had propaganda against socialism since 1917 during the Russian Revolution. And it's been going on all these years, over 90 years about socialism being something bad. So I think this is a very positive thing and it's entering the mainstream and a lot of people that looked upon socialism as being bad, we already have socialism in the United States to a certain degree. Why? It's called the commons. For instance, if you go to the library, you could borrow books and bring them back. You don't have to pay anything unless you bring them back at a later, too late of the day. So that's one of socialism. When you go to school, when I was a kid, you went to school, you didn't have to pay anything. They taught you to read and write and the other basics. And they never said anything about it, but that was socialism. Another thing, if you go to the park, any park in Chicago, you don't have to pay, except maybe Brookfield Zoo, and that's socialism. When you uh, take your car and you go on the roads, that's part of the common, that's socialism. 
So what's wrong with socialism? What's wrong with it is that it'll do away with capitalism. That's what's wrong with it. The capitalists don't like it because their profits will go away. And it's all they're really interested in. For instance, right now, and a lot of speakers brought this out, we have global climate change, and it's obvious to anybody that has even a grade school education what is happening Time's up. In, in the world. So we have to uh, go forth with that and try to overcome it, but you never can overcome it with capitalism. Capitalism is only one thing, making profit. Anything that doesn't make profit is bad. Anything that's good for the country is socialism, and that's bad for capitalism. Next. It's every time anybody mentions the word, it makes stronger. Thank you, Mr. Hunter, for raising some uh, important points. Anti gay. And some are very good. I agree with you on most anti, things. Uh, Furthermore, I'm willing to bet that the majority of okay. Americans agree with you. But you know what? You're not going to win. Like, please put that thought out of your mind. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, there is a whole system in place uh, to keep people like you from getting elected. Now, you are playing an important role by keeping those ideas in the discussion so that slowly they have an effect. Uh, but you're not going to pres be president as a Green Party nominee. The system in against is against you, and the system is stronger than you. However, there is a much better way for you to proceed. The ILP, International Green Party, does not have the same limitations that the Green Party does. We're not an ideological faction within a democracy like the Green Party. We are a whole new system of democracy that creates a fair playing field for your ideas, actually our ideas, so that they can finally succeed decisively. Let me put it to you this way. You talk about creating a fair democratic system. Well, I'm sorry, my friend, but you are way behind times. We have already done that. The International Logic Party has that system. It's a part of that system. All we have to do is to grow it to the point that enough people know about it. And then it's just like a plug and play device. All we have to do, uh, we plug it into the current uh, system to reform it. So here's my proposition. I want us to sit down to talk about how the Green Party and the International Logic Party can work together. Because to together we'll be unstoppable. I want you to see how much power the people have, not just politicians, when we organize through the system of intelligent democracy of the International Logic Party. This is my contact information. I'm looking forward to speaking further with you. Thank you. All right, three minutes, Jonathan. Thanks, Dario. Some United States CMs assume that peaceful democratic mass mobilization had its heyday in the strong militant labor movement, New Deal years of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Henry Helen Keller and Henry Wallace, or the anti-Vietnam War civil rights movement years of Fannie Lou Hamer and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. But when some assume that, remember, the onus is on all of us to reignite the candle by mentoring grassroots struggles, organizing campaigns of everyday people. The political establishment is like a roller coaster. Uh, we the people wait in line patiently for a chance to voice our we dias, as I like to say. We've suffered ideas throughout history. I'd like us to hear we dias, and I'm glad that Dario shared some we dias with us tonight. We can see the ticket window and the boarding gate, but oddly are obstructed from seeing the track of the ride because there is a colossal tarp concealing the entire thing. The most important details of the political system that we are told is so vital to all our quality of life is absolutely unknown. So if, we're, if we agree to go on the roller coaster without at all being guaranteed of its high safety and high quality maintenance and without being informed where it goes and how we will be impacted after it's done, we, will told, we are told everything will be better. And there's all kinds of choices, small local roller coasters, medium regional roller coasters, large national roller coasters, giant international roller coasters. Problem is, it's only when we are on the ride 
surrounded by the harness and locked into our seats, do we fully know how disastrous the entire amusement park is? Not just the one ride, the whole entire structure is finally visible to us. When we go all the way up to the summit, where we have a viewpoint from the most elevated spot, the whole thing's rotten to the core. Only then do we realize there's no proper emergency evacuation ladders. There's no lifts or cranes or baskets in case something malfunctions and goes wrong. Think 2007, 2008. Think Katrina. It's never the case that those who manage and make the decisions and profit off of it are actually riding with the rest of us as fellow riders and fellow passengers. The worst part of it is the roller coaster has yet to be finished, and that's just for the basic expectations we the people have for services, programs, and foundation. Why would intelligent people agree to get on an unfinished roller coaster? Fear, groupthink, self-defeat, low self-esteem, peer pressure, lack of autonomy, confusion, poverty, conformity, no knowledge Time. of history or civics. Time. Ultimately, complete mental breakdown, surrendering all of one's liberties and becoming a full spectator. What in other industrialized countries and democracies happens is actual civics during election time, where you have as many choices as your values exist in that country. We have thousands of choices in the grocery stores, but we only have two on election day? We're not smart enough to choose more than two on election day, but we can choose thousands on grocery day? You've been lied to. That's called a specific word. In linguistics, you find the exact precise language. Treason. Thank you, Dario, for giving us a self-defense tonight against treason. Is he going to run in his room? Um, about the, uh, the only thing that I would uh, disagree with the speaker, or I should start by saying that 97% of the stuff that the speaker talked about, I, I agree with. I'm, I'm not sure how feasible it is, but uh, it's certainly worth talking about it. Uh, the one thing I do disagree with is, uh, maybe not disagree, but have much more questions about, is the idea of giving people a minimum kind of, I forgot the, the phrase. Minimum income. Minimum income. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see the numbers on that. I have a sense that if the government funded this huge project to give people minimum income, the uh, corporations would proportionately jack up all their prices. So, uh, I, which ineffectively really negating the power of the uh, minimum income. But uh, that's really the only uh, complaint I have. I, my, the thing I wanted to talk about is a couple of things that I really uh, think are important issues to be dealt with. The first is this sense of uh, this, this sense of entitlement Americans have about injecting their uh, will on, on other countries uh, where we send our troops unilaterally around the world, 800 military bases around the world, more aircraft carriers than the rest of the world combined. It's just, so how did we get here? In World War II, we won it because we got a whole bunch of countries together and worked together to solve uh, a common uh, world evil. And now we're just kind of whipping people or, or buying them off to join us in these uh, wars. And it's really a shame. I, I wish people, just recently Trump was threatening Maduro in Venezuela. He was saying, you know, you better step aside and the military better not support you uh, or else. It's like, really, we're going to send troops to Venezuela? He wasn't saying it, but implying it. Why, why are we doing this? Well, how come we can't work together with nations to solve these kind of uh, global conflicts? Um, the, uh, oh, now I just had a brain fart. So I forgot what else I was going to talk about, so I'll just leave it at that. I'll go next, Danny. Charlie, you got a rebuttal? I got, I'm going to go next. Tim's going to go next. All right, can you, uh, I'll start myself. I'll let you know. All right. 
nine people put their hands up. We're heading towards 13. <laughs> okay. You know, perhaps maybe a little more socialism, a little tweaking at the edges with taxing the rich, and maybe a little bit more uh, government regulation will probably help us out a little bit. But you know something? I'd all say to all of you that you're dead wrong. <laughs> Capitalism has been known to work and work well in the development of countries. Globalization has been a good thing by interlinking the world together. When men are trading, they're not fighting. Second of all, Adam Smith, who's the advocate and base of a lot of the capitalism that we talk about, also talked about another evil, and that was called uh, corporatism, or as he calls it, uh, anyway, he did not like businesses getting special favors from the government. You talk about child labor? And I'm thinking right now that when a business gets special, special preferential treatment from the government. It's almost worse than welfare. A lot of times these tax increment financing things, these corporate giveaways are just as bad as some of the welfare that's get, that's supposedly profaned out by our, by our things. People should pay their own way, including corporations. And Adam Smith was not against taxes. He acknowledged that there was a commons roads, bridges, yes, health care, fire departments, things like this. There's a definite need for government to help out people and, and stuff in a lower area, and I'm not against programs that do so. What I am against is when it starts going against everything else. Climate change can be solved, and it can be solved very easily through, the, through a little bit more widespread deployment of not the present day reactors that we have, but through through in, through innovation of technology. Yes, I'll say thorium molten salt reactors, but I'll bring that up on the 20th of, uh, of April when we have a debate with Dennis Nelson. Uh, I'm just going to say this. Capitalism has been working for 300 years. Yes, it produces inequality. And when there's monopolies that arise, we have such things as the antitrust laws yeah. to bring them down. We also have other mechanisms to help bring people in place. Social Security was not a bad thing. Medicare was not a bad thing. And right now in a lot of our health care, uh, you know, we probably should need some form of minimum standard to help, uh, help you know, people get on, on board. But we don't need these hyperactive, overarching programs that... Uh, will waste money and waste time. Otherwise, we will turn into Venezuela. America's got the lowest oh, taxes. Thanks. Oh, I'm scared. I'm going to go run and hide under my bed. America's got the lowest taxes of any country, modern country. Oh. Oh. All right, Charlie. All right, Charlie. Bloviate away. Hey, here's a guy to get Blow up here. away, Charlie. It says capitalism produces inequalities. Boy, it does. He, he just discovered that. No, it's been around for a long time. Inequality is inherent. To but the poor are better off now than they were under. Let me thank God. Uh, only got three minutes, so I want to thank uh, Mr. Hunter here for an articulate presentation. And I wish you best in your campaign endeavors. I'll be eclectic on a few issues here. Uh, number one, you mentioned something there, part of your campaign is return tribal lands. It's something I've been dealing with um, since I was on a reservation right out of college. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, what these claims are, uh, what these land, cl land claims are, I, you have to agree a lot. Familiar with the difficulties with land claims uh, in the legal system. Anyhow, that one should, I don't know if that's actually, and given the, the Native Americans, where they lived, I actually, the young lady left here was trying to tell me some Indians were from a particular part of the country. I said, that's an absurdity. I, I have atlases and things like this, and they're just whimsical things. Number two, you said you don't like corporate farms. Well, it, I hate to tell you, we've passed and the old McDonald's had a family farm. Those days are over with. Uh, the 
talking about Tim's capitalism, they have advanced in the days where a guy gets on a tractor and he drives eight hours in, in a straight direction. And that's, that's how he comes to the end of the farm. Uh, there's been a policy in the United States, it's a romantic policy to retain the family farm, but that uh, there's only some, there's no reason to do so. It's not functionally the unit of organization. Uh, it's well beyond that at this point. And unlike any other industry or, or corporate entity. Uh, let's see what else here. Uh, the, the other, I don't want to get too much into this, but you did mention reparations. Uh, my family comes from Dario, uh, Lithuania. We were captive nation, that's what they call them, of the Baltic Republics of the Soviet Union for 50 years, just over 50 years. Do you think we're entitled to any money? From the Soviet Union, maybe? Yeah, yeah. the Russians, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, well, and the other thing is, this thing about reparations, it's, it, the purpose of it is to be made whole. But you're going back to 1619, multiple governments, multiple policies, uh, cross generations. You're gonna, is you going to even find, how do you ask, you going to have to begin to ascertain who you give the reparations to? Who has standing? Is this just something nice to say to you? All right. But there's no serious application. Uh, if you want to uh, have a status quo ante, return them. It, the idea of a reparation is to return you to your, make you old. But is that what you're talking about? Or are you just looking for some money? Okay, and Charlie. And indefinable amount of money. Right. Time, Time out. out. Three minutes, Charlie. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Charlie. One, all right. Thank you very much. Why are we starting 10 to 8 and it's only three minutes? He said there are eight people going to rebuttal. Eight, 10 minutes to 8, that's 40 minutes. We're up to the 13th. Yeah, so now. It's 13 people, Charlie. No, 20 minutes left. Hello, I'm John yeah. O'Connor, and I appreciated everything I heard tonight. There's a lot of good yeah. ideas. However, for the last five years, I've been doing pretty much nothing but watching television, and most of that is political stuff. <laughs> Here's the problem with all of these good ideas. The problem is the Republican Party, they will key in on their next election on a couple of things. Abortion, same-sex marriage, and now we're about to give them a third thing, the word socialism. <laughs> they can get up and give a speech and say same-sex marriage, abortion, socialism, don't vote for that guy. He supports those three things. And a whole lot of Americans will agree with them and they'll vote Republican. I think you have to figure out how to tell a story without using the word socialism. It is what you might call, for lack of a better term, a dog whistle to the people that are not on your side. If you can figure out how to tell a story without that word, I think you have a better chance. That's my thoughts on the subject. Okay, thank you. Andy, I know you got a rebuttal in you. I guess I'm the last rebuttal. Now our speaker will get the last word here. In about three minutes. Oh, and transgender bathrooms in schools, too. That's another part. I would like to thank our speaker. Uh, for all of you that are not aware, uh, virtually everything he talked about, all the good things that can come about with a Green New Deal, that is presented in Naomi Klein's book. This changes everything. And it's available from libraries on disk. Uh, DVD or, you know, it's a sound, it's a disc in, on books. Uh, a few comments here. The largest socialist system in America is the U.S. military. Right. We shovel money to them, there's no competition. Uh, the reason we have 800 bases around the world is not because they're fighting for freedom and justice, it's because 
it's profitable in wartime to sell to the military. Smedley Butler wrote that book back in 1935 when he retired, War is a Racket. Corporations need an almost permanent wartime economy to sell stuff, sell stuff to the military because they make ten times more profit than selling boots, clothes, uh, weapons, all kinds of stuff in peacetime. In, in wartime, it's everything's getting broken and used up and they're getting orders, ten times more orders than they would in peacetime. So we have to attack the idea that um, our soldiers are fighting for freedom and justice all over the world. They're not. Uh, we mentioned the prison system. Uh, we have to recognize that what, what our prison system is, is the new public housing. It's for-profit public housing. It's, it's just that the public housing has bars on it, and they make ten times more money per profit providing that small amount of public housing to a person than you do with any kind of public housing that's subsidized anywhere. Public, the for-profit prison system is immensely profitable. And there are uh, these cages where they're holding kids, immigration kids, on uh, tents or whatever, and, and these small of these cages, they're, they're getting paid $700 per person. Per day. These, these per pro day. Pro per person. $700 per day per person to keep a child in a cage after ripping them away from their parents. These are the kinds of things that the media doesn't talk about. Universal single payer. Uh, the goal in universal non-profit single-payer health care, the goal is to try to keep people healthy, trying to maximize profits, taking everything a person has until they die. That's the goal in America now, is when you go into the hospital, they want to take everything you have through enormous charges until you can't pay anymore. If somebody mentioned uh, in climate change, there's something called... Uh, Fracking. Fracking is the new gold rush for water, clean water. Finish this thought. Fracking is not about any kind of energy. The energy you get out of fracking is way more expensive than oil or gas yeah. anywhere else. Fracking is not about energy. It's about destroying the water tables. So, so that there's going to be a, a new, that's the new gold rush. So the, the fossil fuel companies know this. After fossil fuel is banned, they're going to start selling water and, and at an enormous price. And so um, this is why kids are walking out of school. I mean, it's, I'm, it's school, global school strike for Friday. Okay. And uh, All right. for, for those people that are old, Time's I would up, say, Andy. let me finish this. That um, March 15th marks the, the, the first national Friday nationwide school strike. Kids are taking Fridays off now all over the world to go down and find a representative and protest. They're not just going to the park to play video games or whatever. These kids are saying, as somebody, several people pointed out, we have 11 years, 12 years max. We have to do something for the next four or five years. Take a time out for what we were doing, okay. and like we had World War II. And it's a, but we don't have to kill people like in World War II. We have to build hundreds of billions of tons of all okay. the hardware to get off social, uh, to get off fossil fuel. Four minutes. And the last thing I would mention, I agree with Tim 100%. Our future belongs to nuclear power. But what we have to choose from is between the nuclear fusion that's out there 93 miles away, or fusion reactors on Earth that will take the place of anything they're trying to build now. Talk so, all right. Thank you. Uh, our speaker gets the last word. Speaker would like to come up and uh, rebut some of the uh, rebuttals that you just heard. You have a wide range of some. The new art, the new term for what we see is weaponized ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> I will rebut just some because, of course, everyone's entitled to their perspective and opinion, and not all political persuasions are compatible. I am absolutely a socialist. I make no bones about it, and I have no qualms about saying that I am a socialist. And frankly, the more people say that they are socialists, and the more people admit to wanting that system in our country, a system that actually takes care of the health and the welfare of fellow citizens rather than subjects them to the wolves of capitalist endeavor. The more people are willing to say that, the more as a country will be able to be comfortable with that idea because we've become way too comfortable with profiteering. And I also happen to be a gay socialist. 
So when you talk about same-sex marriage and socialism and how Republicans, you know, that's going to set them off as hot-button issues, well, I guess I'm the Republican's worst nightmare, and I'm okay with that. I'm proud to be your worst nightmare as a black, gay, son of an immigrant, a Jew, socialist. And I'll be that, absolutely. Now, in terms of reparations, reparations are not just giving money out. I, absolutely not that. And that's kind of what we discussed earlier, because you can't make whole just by cutting a check. One of the things I mentioned was a right to claim of action to inherited wealth from the slave trade. That was one aspect of it. But another aspect would be HBCU investment, investing in historically black colleges and universities to stimulate education for African American youth. Because what this is about is we cannot, of course, make up for hundreds of years of slavery and discrimination. There's no way you can erase that. But what we ought to be doing as a country is finding a way to make sure that those who have suffered at the hands of discrimination and racism, that they are able to find that leg up to succeed in society. And education is key to that. We, of course, want to repeal slave clauses that still exist in the US Constitution. I mean, we want to restore lands that have been stolen through violence and terrorism against black people throughout history. So that goes to the root of this idea of making people whole. So much has been systematically done against people of color, and there are so many ways that you would have to endeavor to make them whole. And those are just some examples. So I guess the general thrust of my rebuttal is this. I'm not ashamed about wanting to create a system in this country that takes care of all of our fellow Americans and treats everyone fairly. And if some people find that strange, and that's because they, if they find that strange, it's because they've been conditioned to think that we ought to leave our neighbors to just, unfortunately, die on the street without health care or languish in jobs that pay a pittance while they try to feed their families. And that's just not the America that is a part of my dream or any American's dream that I know. Certainly wasn't the dream that my father came to this country for an immigrant. And we have to work together, as some other speakers have said, this idea of working together to build that country that truly is fairer. And we can do that. The Green Party has the plan to do that. So I thank you for giving me the time to speak here. And I thank you for your interest in our political system. That's a part of what we need, people coming out and taking an interest in their democracy. So thank you. Again. In honor for Steve back there, I'd like to make one final. People aren't clear about the Green New Deal, and uh, the, the one cornerstone you have to remember is people in droves left school in 1941. They took a break from school for four years to solve World War II. And they were heroes when they came back. Skip school for stupid things to go. Charlie, <laughs> it's not your turn to talk. That, see, this is the That's kind of headline we got last week. I just, yeah. I just said yeah. that the greatest generations, yeah. all the greatest generations, yeah. because they left, they left school and went into the military to solve the problem. The problem now is bigger than that. The problem now is bigger than World War II. Somebody needs to go to war. We have Nazi We're out tonight. We'll see you next week. What did they do? Somebody needs to